Hello friends, welcome back to the shop. Today is Sunday, October 2nd, and it is a miserable day here in southeastern Pennsylvania. It's raining, it's cold, it's everything that October shouldn't be, but what are you going to do? Dogs are unhappy. They want to go out and romp and have our normal Sunday routine, and we can't do it. So we're going to do other things. It'll be, it'll all be fine, but yeah, that's the day so far. But uh, got an early start today. Everything's been going smoothly so far. Enjoying some Honda Bookshop in my uh, Talbert Ligne Britannia Bulldog, Squat Bulldog. And this pipe is its not broken in yet. And that's my fault, not the pipes. I just have not been smoking it as much as I should smoke a new pipe. And... The reason behind that is more about me being busy and distracted than not enjoying the pipe. I enjoy it greatly, so glad to glad to have it with me this morning. And spooky season is upon us. It is October, the month of Halloween, so we've got the uh, not really Halloween Zippo. I, I I got it for other reasons, but it kind of fits the season, so. So I've been spending this this weekend a lot of time down here in the shop, uh, getting getting some stuff done. I'm I'm building a chest of drawers for uh, sharpening and sanding supplies, and I've got two side panels glued up. When I finish this video, I'm going to glue up the top, and then I got to work on the bottom. This is all made out of uh, old shelving, old pine shelving that was down here uh, before I redid this corner. Um, actually, it's what I made the bench top here that I do my pipe work on. I uh, made that out of the same pine shelving. That's three quarter inch knotty pine. Nice stuff. Been down here probably since the house was built. So it's probably like at least 40 years old, probably 60 years old. So it's certainly dry. And uh, yeah. So I'm just going to make a little chest of drawers. Um, Nothing fancy. I'm not even going to use drawer glides. I'm just going to put runners in so that drawers can ride on them. Uh, this is just for rough and ready storage. But I'm taking it as an opportunity to uh, get back into joinery because I haven't done that in a really long time. So I'm actually I'm going back and forth on this, but I think I'm actually going to dovetail the top of the carcass uh, and the drawers. And I'm probably going to put... I don't know if I'm going to use a, a rabbit or a rebate, depending on where you live, you call it one or the other, for the bottom, or if I'm actually going to do a, a house data for the bottom. Uh, I haven't quite decided on that yet, but uh, these are, you know, leaving out mortise and tenon, which I don't do very often. The dovetails and the, the house data are two of the most common uh, joints that that I'll use when I'm when I'm doing hand tool work. Um, if I'm doing, uh, you know, quick stuff like that thing I built for holding the uh, Rubbermaid racks or this bench that I built here, I I just use pocket pocket hole screws, Craig pocket holes, or you know whatever's fast. Uh, but I do really enjoy the hand tool work and and uh, you know taking my time and, and doing it quote right. And right fits the purpose you know if, if your goal is to have a bench to do work on pocket hole screws are perfectly right if your goal is to have a nice piece of furniture to put in your uh, your living room then you probably don't want to use pocket holes um, now for some reason I'm making a utilitarian chest of drawers to keep in the basement and I'm going to dovetail it <laughs> But again, it's just to, to get my hands back into it, and uh, I'm looking forward to it. It's, it's, uh, it's going to be fun. That's what I've been doing. Um, like I said, yesterday I got the two side panels glued up, because the, the shelves are only, I think they're like 11 and a half or so wide, and I want to have the, um, the drawers 18 inches deep. So I had a glue up panels for that and of course for the top and the bottom 
Uh, the drawers, I'm not quite sure. I don't know if I'm going to have enough shelving left to make the drawers, so I might have to either buy a piece of pine shelving. I've got some upstairs, but it's it's painted. Um, so I got to... Uh, I don't know. I, I hate... I hate dealing with the paint, so <laughs> obviously it would have to come off, and uh, that's no fun. Anyway, that's been life here in the shop. Um, one sort of entertaining thing that happened yesterday is uh, my dust collector stopped. Well, it didn't stop. It, it, it wasn't sucking anymore, so I, I use it to, like... So the setup I've got is a is a dust collector that you know has a bag on it, a plastic bag that fills up with sawdust. But then I put a cyclone in front of that, which is a large aluminum trash can. Or I don't know if it's aluminum, galvanized. I think it's galvanized steel, actually. Um, the kind of trash cans everybody used to have with the metal lid. You know, I've got one of those with the cyclone unit on top of it. And what happens is everything gets drawn into that and spun around and the heavy stuff falls out the light stuff goes into the bag and that's good for multiple reasons but one of the the biggest ones is that you don't have to change the bag as often because it's a real pain to change these bags uh now unfortunately it's a big enough pain that i neglected doing it for too long it got filled all the way to the top there was like this much space at the top of the bag <laughs> And I couldn't even get a, you know, gather it up enough to put a tie around it. So I wound up putting a 50 gallon contractor trash bag on the ground, opening it up and just lifting this up, setting it down and pulling the contractor bag over it, which worked. Um, you know, thankfully there wasn't a huge mess. It could have been a lot worse. And this is really fine dust. So you don't want that to tip over and, you know, it would have been a nightmare. Anyway, got that all cleaned out, found out there was a clog in the cyclone, which was due to the fact that the, the bag had filled up. And yeah, you know, anyway, got got everything working now again. And I use that for a lot of stuff. You know, I, I, I use it for dust collecting when I'm sanding, but also, you know, just to clean up shavings on the floor and stuff like that. It's, it's really useful. So I'm glad to have that back in service. Yeah, so that's been that's been the weekend. Uh, the week was good. The, well, the week started off crappy. Uh, I thought I was getting a cold. And I guess it was Sunday night maybe it started and went into Monday and Tuesday. And I really thought I was getting a cold. Um, sore throat, stuffy head sort of thing with, with a sore throat. And then it just, like Tuesday evening, just went away. And I guess it was just allergies because we've been getting a lot of rain and, you know, the weather's changing and all that. I guess it was an allergy thing. I have been taking uh, Claritin every day because I do have bad allergy problems. So I just kind of take that year round. But I stopped doing the Flonase, um, which helps a lot. And I probably should start that up again. Anyway, resolved on Tuesday, which was great because I had planned to take the day off on Wednesday and go fishing. <clears throat> which I did. I had a great time. Uh, went to Valley Creek, uh, trout fishing with, with flies, fly fishing. And to be honest, it's it's been so long, I didn't care about the fish. You know, it was, and I didn't expect to catch anything, and I didn't catch anything. But this is the first time I've actually gone fly fish, small stream fly fishing for trout since I recovered from uh, my battle with cancer and that's going on seven years so it was it was wonderful it was like a milestone for me to be able to do this again it was a big day um, and had a great time went out to breakfast uh, had a huge breakfast that I couldn't eat uh, at a local diner but it was great uh, I, I ate half of it I just couldn't finish it and then got to Valley Creek around 10.30ish, uh, which was good because it was cold and, you know, I'd warmed up by then. Uh, got off the water around 4 o'clock because I wanted to beat the rush hour traffic coming back home, which I, I did. Uh, good time. Beautiful scenery. Uh, got lots of casting practice in. Only hooked one tree. Caught 
in the water, caught two leaves and a twig. So that was, you know, it's something. Uh, got a couple of strikes um, on nymphs. Nothing, no, no dry fly action at all. A couple of strikes on nymphs, but I couldn't hook up. And uh, that was the day. But it was, it was just so wonderful to just be out, out on the stream again and walking along the stream. I walked a lot. Um, it was just, just a good day. Um, had an interesting experience, and uh, yeah, I guess I'll tell you about this. It was it, it was interesting. So um, as I'm driving out to um, to Valley Creek, I put on a podcast. It was actually the Orvis Fly Fishing Podcast, Tom Rosenbauer. I used to listen to this all the time, but it gets repetitive and. Um, no, that's not a slam on Tom Rosenbauer or Orbis. It's just, there's only so much you can talk about when people ask, you know, you get these beginner questions and they keep coming up again and again and again, and they do an excellent job answering them. But once you've heard them answer them four or five times, I don't know. And then he'll usually have a guest on or, you know, talk about something. And that that's, that's fun. But about half the show is these viewer or listener questions. and It just gets repetitive. So I haven't been listening to it, but I thought, well, I'm going fishing. Let me throw something on that's fishing related. And that was the first thing that popped up. So, and there was this viewer letter, um, or viewer email. Or, no, I keep saying viewer listener. It was actually a, a recorded audio message. And he was kind of taking taking Orvis to task because Orvis has this initiative where they want to, they basically are aiming for a 50-50 mix of male and female fly fishermen, fly fishers, fly fishermen and fly fisher women. Uh, that's the right way to do this. So 50-50 mix. And, you know, you think about that and that's kind of odd. Um, you know, I've I've known women that fish. I've known women that have no interest in fishing. And I've always thought about these things in terms of, you know, if you're interested in it, go do it. There's nobody saying, hey, women can't fish. Um, if a woman said, hey, I'd like to fish, can you, can you teach me? I'd be happy to do it. I'd love to do that. Um, but I don't think we have to have programs and, you know, all that kind of stuff. I just don't see the point of it. Um, this guy was a bit different in his opinion. He was saying, well, that's going to double the number of people on the streams and it's going to cause environmental impact. I, I don't agree with that. And Rosenbauer didn't agree with that either. The more people that fish, the better, because there's a lot of streams that nobody fishes. And those are the ones that are going to get developed and going to get ruined. Um, so yeah, the more people that fish, the better. But this got into a whole discussion about women and minorities in, in fly fishing. And, you know, the fact that it's considered to be a rich white man's sport. And I don't know, I've known plenty of non-rich folks that, that go fly fishing. Um, well, lots of them. In fact, just about everybody, <laughs> including myself. So uh, that doesn't quite make sense to me. Now, white, yeah, uh, known, and I can't say was, was close with, but, you know, have run into uh, non-whites that, that go fly fishing, you know, people that are black, people that are Asian. Um, so it's not unheard of. Uh, you know, I go to the fly fishing show and, and see people like that all the time. But, yeah, certainly the majority are going to be white and there are women, you know, there are a fair number of women at the fly fishing shows and, and I do see them occasionally on the stream and I'm, and I'm thinking to myself, you know, so they're, they're trying, he, he actually at some point said, uh, we need to have more black women fly fishing. I'm thinking, you know, I don't have anything against a black woman fly fishing, but I've never seen one. And I don't think I'm ever going to see one because I don't think that's what black women want to do. Not that they can't, and not that I wouldn't love to see it, but I just don't think they want to. And I'm driving there and I'm saying to myself, you know, I'll be darned if I'm ever going to see a black woman fly fishing. It's just not ever going to happen. And if it does, 
Maybe that's the day I'll stop fly fishing. Again, not because I've got anything against it, but just because it would be so surprising. Okay, so that that's my thought process. Uh, I'm kidding, of course. I, <laughs> I wouldn't stop, but it was just kind of a way of saying to myself, this is ridiculous. This conversation is ridiculous. Um, so I go out fishing and all that, and I'm, I'm walking back to my, my car. You probably know where this story is going now. I'm walking back to my car and not really looking around or anything, and I hear, hey, did you catch anything? And I look up, and there across the parking lot from me is a, a Jeep, and the back of the Jeep's open, and there's a woman there putting on waders, and she is a black woman. And, you know, chatted with her a little bit about, you know, I told her no, and you know, sometimes I don't think there are fish there, and we laughed about that and, and stuff. and. Uh, she clearly knew what she was talking about. She had all the right gear. She was getting on the stream at a good time because in the evening on the stream you get uh, hatches of midges, so it's a good time to, to fish there. Uh, there she was, the the unicorn. <laughs> and, you know, wonderful woman. I really enjoyed meeting her and chatting with her a little bit. Um, she had some stickers on the back of her car. She's a Navy veteran. Uh, to serve your country, wonderful. Uh, and I, I, it struck me for two reasons. The first is I was surprised by it, and I thought, well, you know, maybe that's not such a good thing. Maybe it shouldn't be surprising to see something like that. You know, may, maybe the the better response is to be happy and to enjoy the diversity that's brought to that that situation. Sorry to use a buzzword, but you know, that's probably the, the right the right emotion to have in that in that situation. And the second is that while I still don't believe we should be forcing people <laughs> into thinking they might want to fish just so they can find out whether or not they do, um, I do certainly believe that, you know, enabling folks regardless of their background, regardless of their their, their race, their color, their creed, whatever, uh, making it easy for them to get access and to be able to do that when they decide they want to is, is a good thing. So, thought you'd enjoy that story. I'm not coming one way, down one way or the other on the whole women in fly fishing initiative. Again, I've got nothing against women fly fishing. I've got nothing against anyone fly fishing, as long as they don't fish where I'm fishing. <laughs> anyway, folks, uh, this is probably running a bit long. Um, hope you're having a great Sunday and looking forward to the week ahead. I'm going to finish up this pipe and I got some coffee here and when that's done, I'm going to glue up the top of my chest of drawers. So you all take care. Enjoy your Sunday, and until we speak again, I look forward to talking to you all again very soon. Goodbye now. Mm -hmm.